I invite you at this time to turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25, verses 12 through 26, can be found in your Pew Bible on page 37. Page 37 of your Pew Bible, where we find our reading this morning, Genesis chapter 25, verse 12 through 26. Hear now the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. This is the account of Abraham's son, Ishmael, whom Sarah's maidservant, Hagar, the Egyptian, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, listed in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, Kedar, Adbil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tema, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedema. And these were the sons of Ishmael, and these are the names of the twelve tribal rulers according to their settlements and camps. Altogether, Ishmael lived 137 years. He breathed his last and died, and he was gathered to his people. His, descend his descendants settled in the area from Havilah to Shur, near the border of Egypt, as you go toward Ashur. And they lived in hostility toward all their brothers. This is the account of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old. When Rebecca gave birth to them. And thus far, the reading of God would, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. You knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Now, when I was younger, I always thought um, that Robert Frost was talking about um, taking the harder path, and somehow taking the harder path, as if you were to come to a, a path, two paths diverge in the woods, and you see one that's covered in um, all kinds of uh, uh, debris, that it's got a tree falling on it, it's, it looks like it hasn't been walked on in years. Um, and you've got a, a nice, easy uh, walking path, you know. Um, and uh, what you do is you decide to take uh, the harder path. And that makes all the difference. But when you actually uh, read the poem a little bit more um, carefully, Robert Frost is talking about coming to uh, a divergence of paths in, in, in the woods. And, and both of them essentially look the same. And the question is the angst of making a decision when you don't really know which way to go. And in fact, I found out that Robert Frost wrote this poem as a joke for one of his friends and colleagues who he used to go on walks with often. And this friend and colleague, who, who is a fellow poet, a fellow, fellow writer, would become so um, 
stressed out when they would come to a, a crossway in the, in the woods because he didn't know which way he wanted to go. He was so indecisive as a human being. And so Robert Frosty wrote this poem as a joke to him. And he got mad that everybody took it so serious. And it became one of his most popular poems. You see, I like this poem now, not because I think... Um, that Robert Frost was talking about taking the, the road that's harder to take because that's how life is, you know. I'm, I like this poem now because I understand how difficult it is to make decisions as a human being, as, as an adult. Understanding and knowing that the, 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 the sense that the decisions that you're making hold so much weight, carry so much. Um, if you go this way or if you go that way, it, it could change the trajectory of your life. Well, unlike us human beings who often deal with that kind of stress, um, God does not experience that. God does not uh, experience angst when he comes to a pivot point in history like we see today where you have contrasted before us two sons, Ishmael, Isaac. Two sons, Jacob, Esau. Who is going to be the promised seed? God is not in heaven quoting Robert Frost's poem about which path he should take in this wooded wonderland. But as a reader, we get the sense that what is being shown to us here in this passage this morning is his faithfulness to the covenant through his gracious election. God shows us his faithfulness to the covenant through his gracious election. Um, we see God choosing the path of salvation in Jesus Christ. Um, and choice is probably not the best word. It's the working out of his decree. It's eternal. Choice sort of elicits a point in time. So we have uh, two points today. Um, the first is the, those two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And the second is uh, the two sons, Esau and Jacob. And we're going to look at these pa this passage in that way. Okay, so let's look first at the contrast between Ishmael and Isaac. And we're given here um, what we call the Toledot. This is the account of Abraham's son Ishmael. The book of Genesis is broken down into a number of Toledots. Well, this Toledot, the, the account of Abraham's son Ishmael, is the smallest of all the Toledots of Genesis. And so, in God giving uh, a, a history of his people, he spends the least amount of time on, uh, on the side character, um, Ishmael, Right? But one thing that we need to understand is that God did give promises. God did make promises to Abraham about Ishmael. God did speak to Hagar about Ishmael and what he would do for Ishmael. And God follows through on these, um, uh, what I would call, sub-covenant promises. God is faithful even in this fashion. And that is that God uh, told Abraham that his son um, would be uh, the father of nations just like Abraham was. And what we read here of Ishmael um, is that he um, had a number of children. And we read um, here in verse 16, these are the sons of Ishmael, and these are the names of the 12 tribal rulers according to their settlements and camps. Uh, now some of these we can connect to history in a variety of fashions. Um, some of these we can look at and say, this probably connects to these people. This probably connects to that city that we know of um, in this area where uh, these people were. Um, but nonetheless, God's promise to you, Abraham and God's promise to Hagar uh, comes through for Ishmael. He is the father of these uh, tribal rulers. And then we uh, read, Ishmael lived 137 years. He breathed his last and died. He was gathered to his people. Um, his descendants settled in this particular area. And the last thing that we're told about um, Ishmael is something that also God said earlier, that, that the Ishmael would be at odds with his brothers. Um, and that is that he would be in hostility toward all the brothers. 
Um, And there are a number of uh, historical points between Israel, the descendants of Israel, the descendants of Isaac, and the descendants of Ishmael, uh, where they come into conflict with each other. Um, And so this is um, something that we read, is that there is not only a contrast, but there's a continued conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. God is faithful even to these sub-covenantal promises, um, but God is trying to show us here that he is continuing to be faithful in the promise that he gave in Genesis 3.16. The seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. That there is going to be um, a seed of Abraham that will come, and through him will be a blessing to all of the nations of the world. And that's why after the smallest Toledot of Genesis in describing Ishmael and his descendants and describing the kind of relationship that Ishmael would have to the covenant people in future days um, for a time to come, we, we uh, then transition to the next Toledot, the one of Isaac. And this is what we read. Abraham, Abraham became the father of Isaac and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. And Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. Now, what you get, the sense that you get from um, these first few verses is that a lot of Isaac's life is compacted into a very short synopsis. Um, A synopsis uh, is a beautiful thing. It's like reading the cliff notes on the story that's happened before. If you ever watch a TV show, Sometimes they'll give you a review at the beginning of the TV show ep- episode so you'll know what's happening in the current episode. Um, right now, I'm about to start uh, the fourth book in a uh, fantasy series called The Stormlight Archive, and all these books are 900 plus pages, and it's been three, four years since the last book came out, and so either I'm going to go back and read the first and the second and the third book, or I could find a synopsis of all of the important events that have happened in those books so that I can dig right into the, the latest book, okay? This is sort of like a synopsis of Isaac's life all the way up to this point. Uh, the expansion of which we have heard already in the story of, of uh, Abraham's servant going and finding Rebekah and so on and so forth. What we find is that Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. And Isaac gets to sh- have a shared experience with his father. He has a wife that he loves that is barren. That's barren. Um, now, it's hard to tell exactly when all these things are happening, but my guess is... Uh, That at the time, in in the years, the 20 years, that Isaac is praying for his wife, Rebecca, before Rebecca is pregnant and has uh, the twins, that his father, Abraham, is alive for some part of that time and having more children. His brother, Ishmael, is alive and having a bunch of children. And so I'm, I'm sure that Isaac has to be wondering, God, what is your plan for me? God, what is it that you're going to do? God, why are you not answering my prayers? God, what is going on in my life that this is happening? So there's a contrast there um, given that might bring doubts into the mind of Isaac about God's faithfulness to the covenant. God's faithfulness to the covenant. But... We see that Isaac is a man of faith. Because in verse 21, we read that Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And what we grasp from this is that unlike his father Abraham, there was not a crisis of faith wherein um, Hagar is given to, a maidservant is given to Isaac, and, and the maidservant has a child so that uh, Isaac could have a descendant, Isaac could have somebody who could receive the inheritance. None of that is going on. For 20 years, Isaac simply prayed to the Lord that the Lord would give them a child. And we read, the Lord answered his prayer. And his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. 
Now, this is a reminder to us about the importance of not giving up in prayer. I'm fond of, of the analogies that Jesus gives about prayer. Um, he, he, uh, he often argues from the lesser to the greater. And he gives, he gives an analogy um, grounded in human experience about uh, a woman who is upset because her son has been at the receiving end of injustice. And so this woman complains to the judge continuously. And this judge is a corrupt judge. This judge is not a good judge. This judge has, um, uh, he's, uh, doesn't know what justice is. But because this woman is so annoying, he'll just do what she's asking so she'll leave him alone. And then Jesus does this really provocative thing and he says, this is how God is. And you're like, wait, what? God is an incorrupt or a, a corrupt judge that doesn't care about what we're asking him? No. Jesus is saying, if a corrupt judge who doesn't care about people will do what this woman asked because she's persistent in asking, what do you think a good judge and a loving and caring father will do for you? 20 years Isaac prayed for his wife. How many opportunities is that to give up and to say, that's enough, I'm not trying anymore. I'm not worried about this anymore. I'm not going to stress about this anymore. I'm not going to pray about this anymore. It's too much. 20 years he prayed for his wife. He was persistent in prayer. And God showed his faithfulness. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. It may be true that Ishmael had many sons and these 12 sons became the um, heads of these tribes. Um, it may be, it may, may be true that um, Isaac after 20 years, only had these two twins. Um, but it's also true that through one of his sons, Jacob, there would be the 12 tribes of Israel. And that through these 12 tribes of Israel, there would be one tribe called Judah. And through this one tribe called Judah, there would come a king named David. And through this king named David, he would be given the promise that there would be somebody descendant from him that would sit on the throne of David forever. And through that one uh, family, David, and the tribe of Judah would come the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would save sinners. Who would become the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Do not blink. Do not scoff the God of small beginnings. That's the kind of God we have. So that's Ishmael and Isaac. Um, but we also have a contrast between uh, two different sons as well, two seeds, um, and Esau and Jacob. What we read is uh, when Rebecca became pregnant, the babies jostled each other within her. And I'm pretty sure that um, while my wife was pregnant, she read this. Uh, Abraham, if Abraham was still alive, because we do know that in, in, in some fashion, say Abraham would op operate as a prophet. He would pray to God on behalf of others and be given answers. Um, we do not know if this, uh, this um, message came to her in a dream. Uh, we don't know if uh, this is something that she brought to Isaac, and Isaac has sort of taken over this mediator role um, that uh, his father Abraham had. But what we're told is that when she went to inquire the Lord, the Lord answered her. And this is what the Lord told her. Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Um, see, up until this point, there hasn't been... Um, too much controversy about who is going to be the seed, um, singular. 
Now there was in, in the life of Abraham that little debacle with Ishmael. Ishmael was, um, but you could say Ishmael was, was, wasn't really a full-blooded um, Israelite, right? And so God, in order to show that the, 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 the covenant is going to be through Isaac, sent Ishmael away. You're going away. Um, but now what we have is an interesting controversy. We have two babies, twins, in the womb. And, and because we've already been shown through Isaac and Ishmael that the seed, the, 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 uh, the covenant has to be carried down through one specific descendant, we ought to already be thinking, oh no, there's going to be some tension here. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And so when Rebecca prayed, she was told, yes, you do realize that these two sons, they're going to diverge, that not both of them are going to be recipients of the covenant. They are going to become two nations, two peoples, and one was going to be stronger than the other. And shockingly enough, God says the older will serve the younger. The older will serve the younger. This was not the way things went in those days. In those days, it was always the oldest son who was the one that inherited. It was always the oldest son who got the double inheritance, the double portion. The oldest son was the one who would be the inheritor of the father's estate, the one who would carry on the father's name. And before these two sons are even born, God is already telling Rebecca that that's not how this is going to go. That's not how this is going to go. In fact, we are told about this in more detail from the perspective of God in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, Paul begins to describe the current context of the gospel. And what he's describing about that is, why is it that as the gospel is going out, um, most of the Israelites, most of the Jews are rejecting the gospel, uh, but Gentiles are coming to faith? Isn't the people of, of Israel, God's chosen people, why aren't they the ones who are believing the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah? Why is it the Gentiles are the ones that are believing? Well, Paul says this is how God has always operated. God's sovereign choice has always been this way. He says in verse 7, not because they are his, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I'll return and Sarah will have a son. So um, um, Paul says, first things first, um, Ishmael is not the inheritor of the promise. Isaac is. God has the sovereign choice, right? In verse 10, though, he continues on. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father. Our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What is, what is Paul saying here? He's saying here, this sovereign choice has nothing to do with what these two people did. The sovereign choice has nothing to do with the fact that God doesn't like hairy red people. But he prefers Weasley people who like to lie and steal and cheat, like Jacob. Doesn't have anything to do with that. These two sons haven't even been born yet. They haven't done anything right or wrong. 
But in order that God's choice in election, that we would know that it's up to God, it's God's choice, not ours. In order that we would know that we're the clay, he's the potter. In order for us to know that God has the right to choose. And we can't criticize. They're told the older will serve the younger. And what we read after word here, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red. His whole body was like a hairy garment. They named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand, grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was six years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Their birth story even begins to tell you the kind of conflict and um, tension that they will have in their relationship and their family because of them, because of their differences. Um, but what is being told to us um, by Paul um, in his commentary on this very passage um, is that um, Jacob is not chosen because he's better. Esau is not chosen because he's not better. This is simply God showing us his faithfulness to the covenant through his gracious election. This is God choosing sovereignly so that we might know he is the one that gives grace. We might know that he is the one that often undermines the way the world operates. That we might know that he chooses the things, the foolish things of this world, the weak things of this world. That he might know that we weren't chosen because we were choice of meats. That we weren't chosen because we somehow are qualified or better than other people in this world. That we might know that God shows his grace to those who do not deserve grace. In a very real sense, what we have here could be viewed from the human perspective, perspective as a uh, point of divergence in the story. Um, a crossroads where we see two separate paths. Um, and, and, and we could say, wow, what if things go this way? Or if, what if things go that way? But instead, what we are told is we can be confident about redemptive history because we have a sovereign God who's in control of historical events and narratives. A God who had Rebecca be pregnant with two boys so he could teach us a lesson about election. A God who does not uh, struggle with uh, choices and crossroads like we do as humans. We stand there at the point where two paths are before us and we, we have an existential crisis because we can't imagine that if we go this way, God would not be with us. Or if we go that way, that's the path that God honors. Rather than knowing that whatever path we choose, God is in control. And so unlike um, Robert Frost, who, uh, who prided himself on taking the load, road less traveled, the one less traveled by, and that made all the difference in his life, um, we have a God who is sovereignly ordering all things in this world and in this life to bring about the greatest revelation of his glory and is doing it all in a way that's for our good. We have a God who weaved this pattern all throughout redemptive history to the point where Jesus Christ came into this world, died on the cross for our sins, was raised three days later, ascended to sit at the right hand of God the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. We know. We can be confident. We can be confident 
not in our choice, but in God's. And God shows us his faithfulness to the covenant through his gracious election. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, that you have um, been sovereign in this redemption that you've given to us in Jesus Christ, that it's not by chance that all these things have come, come about, come to be. But, um, but that you've been faithful. You've been faithful to the covenant. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we would know in all humility what it means, uh, gracious election. Um, may it be something, Lord, that um, we in humility accept. And uh, may it be something, Lord, that... Um, increases our, uh, our worship of you, our understanding of grace and mercy. Um, it may be something that in- increases our, um, our understanding of the work of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Two sons, two seeds, two paths in our passage before us. Um, but Lord, you took the ordained path. You took the path that has led uh, to Jesus Christ and has led to our salvation in him. Um, and that has made all the difference. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you sing with me? Psalter hymnal 335. Psalter hymnal 335. Come thou long expected Jesus. It will be on the screen.